Thank you, Jeremy. It's good to see you all this morning. How is everybody? Good. You awake now? I feel like we need to get up and do some calisthenics. Thank you to the worship team this morning for leading us so ably today and allowing God to work through them in this place. Um, As a lot of you know, Pastor Mike is uh, away for a little bit. He is in New Hampshire with Kathy's family, and uh, so he's enjoying some time of rest, hopefully. I don't know if it's a lot of rest because they're all there, but uh, at least some time of relaxation. But he will be back with us in a few weeks. And uh, so I get the honor of bringing the word to you guys this morning. So I'm excited about that. Um, Before I do that, I also have the honor of introducing, we hired a new school principal in the last few weeks. And so Mrs. Gail Bergstrand is going to be our new school principal for Christian Hill School. So we are very excited that she is going to be joining us again, and um, Gail was our principal about 10 years ago or so and did a fabulous job, and so we're excited to see the new direction God's going to take the school through her leadership, and uh, so it's going to be good, yeah? Yeah. So as you guys know, I go through a lot of scriptures, so if you want to grab Bibles, you can. I'll try and keep you up where we are, but um, I'm excited about the message that God has placed on my heart today. Um, We've been doing a series called You Asked For It. I feel like we should do a game show. Ready? Here we go. You Asked For It. Very good. Very good. So Pastor Mike talked about drawing near to God about two weeks ago. And one of the ways you draw near to God is through worship, obviously, which is what we've been doing for the last 45 minutes or so. And we've been connecting with God and allowing God to speak into our hearts and into our minds and hopefully into our lives. And I hope that you guys took the opportunity to just hear from him. And if you didn't, don't worry, because there's always another chance. I know one thing about God. God is always knocking. God is always wanting to speak. And all you have to do is just become open to his, to his voice and to his word. He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. And last week we talked about Leviticus, and that was about holiness. And sanctification was the big word of the day. Sanctification means to be set apart. It means we're, we're, we're called to be different. We're called to be unique people in a world of mess. We as Christians get the opportunity as sanctified Christians to be lights in a dark place and to be water in a dry place and to give voice to a place where there's confusion. And so that's what last week was. Well, this week... It's called, You Hungry Yet? We're talking about fasting today. How many of you, I'm afraid to ask with a show of hands, so you guys can keep your hands down, but answer in your own head. How many of you fast on a regular basis? And if you don't, can you answer to yourself real quick, why don't I? Is it because I don't understand it? Is it because I can't eat before 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm a bear? Is it because I have to have my Starbucks coffee and I'm not willing to give it up? Or is it because maybe I just don't really get what the power is in when I fast? And so I'm going to try and teach you a little bit of that today. So Chinese bamboo. Any experts on Chinese bamboo in the room? Anybody? Anybody? No. Okay. Okay. So Chinese bamboo is a very interesting bamboo. You plant it, and it sits in the ground, and it appears to not make any changes for about five years. Five years you plant this thing, and you don't see anything. You water it, you nourish it, you talk to it, some of us weird plant people. But we, and then you don't plant anything else in its place, but for five years there's nothing happening in the bamboo world. Then... All of a sudden, over a six-week period, it grows, get this, 90 feet in six weeks. Five years, nothing. Watering it, feeding it, nourishing, seeing no result. And in six weeks, 90 feet. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what it does. Spiritual transformation in us happens sometimes the same way. 
We water, we plant, we worship, we listen to podcasts of, of, of preachers. We spend all this time and we go, God, I'm not seeing changes. Nothing's happening, God. What is going on? Why am I bothering doing this? And then all of a sudden, boom, 90 feet high, spiritual giant. A situation comes into your life, a problem arises, someone needs a prayer, and all of a sudden you go, hey, hold on, where did that come from? Well, it comes from your years of putting in the work of, of feeding and watering and nourishing. Well, that work stuff is called spiritual disciplines. There's a great book by Richard Foster called Celebration of Discipline. It's one of my favorite books. I try to read it once a year. It's a little bit of a tough read, but highly recommend it. And spiritual disciplines talk about how do I draw nearer to God? What do I need to do to get to that deeper level with God? And fasting is one of those things that you need to do in order to draw to the next level of, of, of closeness to God. It's like working out muscles. You know, how many of us, like, I got a party next Saturday, but I haven't worked out in three weeks. I wonder if I work out every day for the next six days if I'll be able to fit into the dress that I'm supposed to wear. Like, that's how we look at working out, right? We, we, we change, we want to have instantaneous results. But that's not the way Christianity works. See, salvation is right away. You, you give your heart to God, and he, he is yours, and you are his, and you become his child. And all of the keys of the kingdom are yours. All the blessings, all the promises are yes and amen. They belong to you from the start. But spiritual growth, the walk, takes work. And it takes time. And it takes discipline. And it takes obedience. And it takes drawing near to God. And it takes sanctification. It takes that being set apart. So fasting is just one of those things that go with that. If you want to look in your Bible, our scripture, our scripture today that we're going to base everything around is Matthew 6. But we're going to kind of be all over the Bible today. Matthew 6, starting at verse 16. And while you're looking there, let me just pray for us. Lord God, I pray today that, Lord, the words that um, come out of my mouth be the words that you want us to hear. God, I pray that you challenge our hearts and our minds and our lives. God, I pray that the things that we learn today become applicable. God, that we become a hungry people after you that are wanting more of you. We give you our hearts today. In your name we pray. Amen. Matthew 6, 16 says this. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure or they contort their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, look good. Comb your hair. Don't look unhealthy. So that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, to Him who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret, here's the great part, will reward you. So don't worry about what everybody else thinks and knows. You don't have to go around and, Marilyn, I'm fasting. Can you tell? I am so hungry. Why are you so hungry? Well, I'm fasting. Why haven't you combed your hair in three days? Well, I'm starving and I can barely lift my arms up. I'm so hungry because I'm fasting. He doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to go about your normal daily routine. And realize that the reward we get is a reward that is a spiritual reward. It's in here. We get to know God more. He speaks to us in those quiet places. So here Jesus tells us why not to fast so that others can see it. You see, fasting is not a commandment. Everyone hear that? It is not a commandment of God. But if you read this text, Jesus expected it to be a common practice of his disciples. Look at that wording again. It says, not if you fast or you must fast, but the wording is when you fast. It's expected. So we must ask ourselves if the intention for Christians was to be fasting, 
why isn't this part of our regular walk and talk with God? If Jesus wanted his disciples doing it, then why aren't we doing it? And this is why I think our overabundance masks our spiritual starvation. Let me say that again. Our overabundant mask, our spiritual starvation. We have so much of everything, everything, that we are not realizing that we are actually hiding the thing that we need most. That hole that we are trying to fill with busyness, with food, with schedules, with social media, with TV, with friends, with jobs, with whatever, we're all working so hard to mask the fact that what is hurting inside of us is a lack of intimacy with God. More than any other spiritual discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. We try and cover up what is inside us with food and other good things, but in fasting, these things come to the surface. See, if pride controls us, It's revealed almost immediately when you fast. David writes, I humbled myself with fasting in Psalms. Fasting reminds us that we are sustained by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Food does not sustain us. God sustains us. See, it's contrary to what we know on a physical side. You kind of have to release that, that thought pattern for a minute and realize we're talking about something connecting with God in a deeper basis than just our physical need. In many ways, the stomach is like a spoiled child. And a spoiled child does not need indulgence, but needs discipline. We have to learn to discipline ourselves in order sometimes to hear God's voice. Well, I had a little discipline these last few days that I wasn't expecting. Um, Tony and I went to the Orland uh, Market Thursday night, and we're sitting around waiting for a band to start. I said to him, you know, I'm just not feeling good. And every 15 or 20 minutes, I'd complain to him for the next thing. My hips started to hurt. My calves started to hurt. My jaw started to hurt. So we got leaving and putting the stroller in the car, and I'm like, man, something just isn't. I'm dizzy. So get home. I put Amelia to bed. Luckily, she went right to bed. I went and laid sideways on my bed, stomach down, and passed out for maybe 45 minutes or so and woke up violently ill. I haven't been sick like that in forever. Spent the night getting stuff out of my system that I didn't even know I had. So all of a sudden, I am down for the count. Spent Friday pretty much on the, count, on the couch. Amelia watched movies all day long. She touched me, and my skin hurt. It was the weirdest sickness I had ever had. But all of a sudden, I'm like, I want nothing to do with food. I want, and finally, I have an appetite back today, and it's a miracle how fast God can heal a body. But, you know, all of a sudden, you just realize the food is the enemy right now. And uh, that was a spiritual discipline I was not really ready for this weekend, but um, we got it. Anybody watch Naked and Afraid or Alone? They're both cable shows. Anybody like those? I'm a little addicted to those. I hate to say it. Naked and Afraid is this show that they drop two complete strangers off naked in the middle of nowhere, like Africa, Mongolia, like nowhere. And they have a knife and like a bag, and that's it. And they have 21 days that they have to survive naked and afraid. There's lions that are chasing them and bears knocking on their shelter and all this kind of stuff. And alone is the same idea, but to another extreme. Alone, they at least get clothes. But alone is there's one person, no camera crew, they're filming themselves. And they are, they are actually in Mongolia for this season. And they survive as long as they can. So Last season, I think someone was out there 90 days. No food. They get 10 pieces of equipment to help them. So like fishing line, a knife, they get a tarp. But they're building shelters and killing animals and fishing and doing everything that they possibly can do. But I'm a little bit addicted to these shows. And it's amazing to me because these guys come out and these girls come out and they're survivalists. They're ready. They're ready for the challenge. And you know what the first thing is that takes most of them out? Hunger. They're so hungry that they can't think of anything else but a cheeseburger. 
And they get a little uh, satellite phone that they can tap out, so at any time they're relatively safe. Um, but hunger is the thing that drives them. But what's interesting, when you read shelter or, or survivalist websites and that kind of stuff, what they tell you to do is worry about water first, fire, shelter, and then food. Food's not even considered one of the most important things when you're a survivalist. It's up there, obviously, but it's not one of the most important things. But yet we base so much of our existence on having substance. See, but the way we have to look at fasting is fasting is feasting. John 4, the disciples bring lunch to Jesus. Jesus has been teaching all day, and he's, they're assuming that he would be starving. But he says this, Jesus says in John 4, I have food to eat of which you do not know. My food to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This was not a clever metaphor, but a genuine reality. Jesus was in face, being nourished and sustained by the power of God. He was getting his nutrition from the power of God. This is why in Matthew 6, Jesus tells us not to look miserable when we're fasting, we are actually feeding on God so that we are sustained by the word of God. Jesus said, if you fast with, with the motive, without the motive to impress others, your fasting in secret will be rewarded by, in secret by the Father. In the secret place, God is there. Your Father in heaven is your reward. And this is the great purpose of all the fasting. It's a means through which we draw near to God, and he rewards us with the knowledge of his presence. Fasting is not about suffering for suffering's sake. It's about passing up the appetizers and the salads for the main course. It's the opportunity to know God and to know his will. In that sense, it's far more satisfying than anything you've given up for the sake of knowing him. So many of us just keep eating the appetizers of life and the salad course of life, and they say, I'm full. This has been good enough without even realizing that there is a main course that is far greater and far more satisfying, which is why I challenged you this morning when we started to worship. Do you want to hear from God or do you just want to be in the room? Do you want to see him and, and have him change your life or are you okay just punching your card for another Sunday morning and look, God, I did what you tell me to do. cha -ching. God wants to speak to you. God wants that relationship with you. But so many of us have settled for less than. And he's saying, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Call on my name, and I will answer you. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that I serve, at least. When I call his name, when I'm in need, Man, he is just right there to answer. But that's because of the five years of spiritual growth, the 10 years, the 20 years, of sometimes not always seeing the bamboo plant shoot up 90 feet. But now I'm in a spot in my life that I get to see that bamboo plant a lot more. I'm starting to reap the benefits of the years that I have done with him and the struggles that I have gone through with him. I'm seeing that more and more in myself. And he wants that for you guys, too. We spend a lot of time fasting from God and feasting on food and life's other pleasures. So what exactly is fasting? Throughout Scripture, oh, i got to start moving, guys. Woo! We'll be out by 12, I promise. Anybody hungry? Tony, can you get snacks? See the Cheerios in the nursery for everybody. Anybody hot? Anybody warm in here? Yeah, I kind of, uh, that's all right. That's all right. We're burning calories, right? So, so what is fasting exactly? Throughout Scripture, fasting is referred to as the abstaining of food for spiritual purposes. The abstaining of food for spiritual purposes. It's not a hunger strike. Gandhi was not fasting for spiritual God-given purposes. It's not a diet plan, even though that can be a benefit. Fasting, if done the way Scripture describes, is a very spiritual practice to aid one's spiritual life. Biblical fasting always centers on spiritual purposes. Let me say that again. Biblical fasting always centers on spiritual purposes. 
In Scripture, the normal means of fasting involves abstaining from all food, solid or liquid, but not from water. Luke 4, 2 describes for us as Jesus' fast of 40 days. We're told he ate nothing, and at the end of the fast, he was hungry. Well, hello, Captain Obvious, like that's 40 days of not eating. Of course he's hungry. Thank you, Scripture writer Luke, for letting us know that Jesus was hungry after 40 days. Now, we sometimes hear about fasting other things such as food and TV and cell phones. I don't call those things fasting. I refer those more to a time of specialized consecration or, or separation or sacrifice something. But when we're talking about biblical fasting, it's actually about food. I was, as I researched this and looked through scriptures, I saw nothing else other than food. Now, there's different food fasts that you can do. There's the Daniel fast. There's the Jesus fast that was the extreme fast. So there's different levels that you can do it. And obviously, if you're interested, always, I have to put this caveat out there, check with your doctor first. Make sure that you're healthy enough to do that because medicines and everything else can mess that up. But God's idea of fasting was food. So why then do we fast? We fast. What are some of the purposes? We fast for a miracle. That is one of the reasons that we fast. Most of the examples of fasting in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, Old Testament occur in the face of great danger. If you want to turn to 2 Chronicles 20, you can. Real quick, Second Chronicles 20, starting at the beginning of that chapter, it says this. The Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the Mennonites, came to war, wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, <clears throat> excuse me, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. That army is already in Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. Jehoshaphat needed a miracle. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So Jehoshaphat had an army coming against him, so what he does first is he calls for a fast. If you want to flip to Esther 4. When Queen Esther was made aware of Haman's plot to kill all the Jews, she instructed Mordecai in Esther 4 to do this. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do you think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews are, who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I in my attendance will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. There are times when we realize the only hope that we have is the Lord's favor. We need a miracle. In those times when you and I need to inquire of the Lord, when we need to ask him something, when you need that miracle, fasting is one way that actually tunes our attention to God. Fasting is not about getting God's way into our lives. It's not about changing his mind. Fasting is about getting our hearts tuned to what God's will is. We can express our desperation for him above all other things and make us hear his reply and see his swift hand in our lives. Fasting gets to us to a place that so much of the other stuff becomes non-important for a while. All the chaos, all the extra becomes less and we become tuned to the voice of God. So what became of these cool two new miracles? Back to the first one of Zechariah. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow's march down against them. They will be climbing up 
from the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jurel. You will not have to fight this battle. There is this vast army coming up against him. He has fasted, and he is being told, you know what? You're not going to have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Early in the morning, they left for the desert, and they began to sing and praise. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. You see what God did here? They never had to lift a finger. The enemies all destroyed each other. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder. How an incredible story. Jehoshaphat's army was going to be defeated. He fasted, and God had a tremendous miracle that came out of there. What happened with Esther? Well, we all know that story, right? Right? Yeah. So Mordecai was Esther's uncle. And there's this guy, Haman, that has decided that he basically hates the Jews. And he has connived with the king, who is Esther's husband, a way to kill all the Jews. Well, you know what winds up happening in the end? Haman winds up being the one that's killed. Esther and Mordecai are honored and respected and revered throughout the land. Fasting is there for a miracle. We should be fasting for miracles. What miracle are you needing in your life? Is it a physical need, a financial need? Do you have a child that has wandered from God? In those situations that we have done all that we can, it's time to allow God to work in our lives. Another reason why we fast. We fast for direction. Nehemiah 1 says this, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. See, Nehemiah was away. He had been out of Jerusalem for most of his life. And slowly but surely, the Jews were returning to Jerusalem, and Nehemiah was getting a report. And the report said to them, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah needed direction in his life. He did not know yet what God had in store for him. He did not know the plan to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. From this time, he received his marching orders to go repair the walls of Jerusalem, though. From that time of fasting is when God began to speak in his life. He needed the direction. You're probably aware that God has a purpose for your life and a work for you to do. But have you ever wondered what that purpose was? Did you ever find yourself unsure about what, would, what God wanted you to do? Most of us struggle at times to discern the plan in our life. Well, the way to do this sometimes, the way to find God's direction in our life is through fasting and prayer. It makes an important difference. It opens up your heart to hear God's direction. Fasting puts you in alignment with your assignment at any age. See, sometimes we think that 16-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 21-year-olds and 25-year-olds need direction. But when you get to 40, 45, 75, you don't need that anymore. God, you set my course here we go. The thing is, God's always wanting us to do something different. He's always wanting us to, to use us in a new way. And sometimes we need to settle ourselves, we need to fast, and we need to seek God and find out what that direction is that he has for us. When the church was brand new, back in the New Testament, Christ had come, he had died, he had risen again, and he, and he left. When that church was just developing, in Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Paul needed direction on how the church should go. And he fasted and he prayed. 
When, the, when Israel was becoming a new nation after hundreds of years of slavery, trying to establish the identity that they would have with Yahweh, this is what happened with Moses in Exodus 34. Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread and drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenants, the Ten Commandments. The commandments came after Moses' time of fasting and prayer. So when you're not sure about what the plan is, remember that God wants to show you and that when you fast and you pray, you're allowing God another place to speak into your life. You're opening up another section of your heart for God to hear you and for you to hear God. Another reason why we fast is we fast over our sin. When Jonah finally got around to preaching in Nineveh, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Sackcloth was this rough, coarse cloth or bag-like garment that was worn as a symbol of repentance. When Nineveh heard the message of coming judgment, they did a quick moral inventory and realized they were about to get what they had coming. So they began to mourn over their sin and cover themselves in hope of finding mercy. Listen to the decree of the king from Jonah in chapter 3. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. Fasting can be, for us, a means of wearing the sackcloth. We fast over our sin. It's a way to enter into mourning over the sins that separate you from God. When you're fasting, you'll be amazed at how aware of your sinfulness you become. It's like a light is, is shown on those areas of your heart that need work. Once your stomach is out of the equation, God begins to work in so many different areas. The fast then provides a great opportunity for repentance. Putting off the old self and putting on the new. A view of God's mercy calls us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, that we are holy and pleasing to God. Fasting and prayer, if faithfully done, if the five years of bamboo growth is done, they alter your existence. They really rock your spiritual world. And they bring your life on this earth into God's perspective. Again, we get tuned into the voice of God. We get tuned into the direction of God. We get tuned into what God wants for us as individuals. Jeremiah 16 says, My eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. God sees our sin like a flashing neon sign. And fasting away is a way for us to mourn that, to put on the, the sackcloth, as it says in the Old Testament, and to admit where we are with God and to realize that we have areas in our life that we still struggle with. Does anyone other than myself have areas of your life that you struggle with as Christians? Do you have those areas that, God, that Satan keeps knocking up on the side of your head because he knows that that's your weakness? Well, fasting is a way to, number one, get strength through that. But it's also a way to say, God, I need help. I'm not doing well on this on my own. God, like the easy stuff is the easy stuff. I've gotten rid of all that easy stuff that I'm not supposed to do. But the inner stuff is hard. Sometimes we just need to have a time of fasting and admit our sin and let God shine the light, the healing light of his love into those places. And all of a sudden, those chains can be gone. And we can be released from that heavy burden that we carry. I don't want to be a sinner. I don't want to carry the guilt of that. And God does not want that for me. And fasting is one of the ways that we can help alleviate that. Our overabundance masks our spiritual starvation. We said this in the beginning. Our overabundance masks our spiritual starvation. 
So how long does it take bamboo to grow? Is it five years or is it six weeks? Yeah. How long does it take us to mature as a Christian? Yeah, forever is right. Man, if you guys feel like you've gotten where you need to be and there's nothing else that needs to grow in your life, let me know how you got there. Because uh, this, is, this is how God designed it, though. This isn't a negative thing. This isn't a, a sad thing. This isn't a hard thing. God designed the journey of Christianity to be like this for one reason. And I've said this before when I preached. God could have made salvation, that, that spot of salvation, be the end all. He could have given us everything we needed. He could have cured us from every wrong thing that we had ever done. He could have taken away every temptation that we would ever face in our lives at salvation. Right? I get saved when I'm 20. I'm good for 70 years. Here we go. God didn't design it like that, and you have to wonder why. And I think I know. Because he wants relationship with us. He wants the journey with us. He wants to see the growth. I love seeing the growth in my daughter. I, it brings me to tears sometimes to see the newness in her and see the excitement in her. She started singing in the last month or so. And it's a little bit of a drunken sailor singing, but she's singing. And it's just, I mean, it melts my heart. We have a night-night song that we do every night, and she just... <laughs> And uh, it's just beautiful, though. And I love seeing her growth and development. And that's how God looks at us as his children. He loves to see the growth. He loves to see the development. And there's moments where we sway from that path a little bit. And there's moments where he's got to knock us back a little bit. And, you know, hey, you know, you need a little discipline in this area. But there's also those moments that he pours out his grace, and he pours out his mercy in those areas. And I love the fact that he loves us so much. And I love the fact that he's constantly forgiving us so much. So when we fast, we fast to grow closer to him. At the end all, it's to grow closer to him. And so I want to encourage you, if, if, if you've never tried it, take a look at it. Start small. Start with a meal. But if you fast, realize it's not just about giving up food. It's about the replacement. See, I can go, I can skip breakfast and run to work, and it's like, oh, yeah, I fasted today. I forgot. That's not the idea. The idea is I'm giving up my lunch eating and my lunch hour to spend time with God. I'm intentionally filling up what would have normally been this food time with time with him. And that's what he wants more than anything with his kids. Those of us that are parents, that we, that's what we want more than anything, right? It's just time with our kids. I don't care what I'm doing, right? I love just watching her spin in her circles until she gets dizzy dancing and then falls on the ground. Like, that's exciting for me. But that's what God wants. He just wants time with us. The world around is trying to convince that we have enough. If we have big enough houses and nice enough car. A busy enough schedule, we have enough. But any of those that have tried to find satisfaction in those things know that they just leave us hungry. The only way to fill our appetites is to feast on God, to find out that the manna that he provides is enough to sustain us daily. I love the symbolism that he is the bread of life in this. I love the fact that he uses a food to help us understand that he is our sustainer and he is our provider. Tony, if you don't mind coming up, we're just going to pray, and I'm going to pray over you guys, and we're going to hopefully cool off in a few minutes in our air-conditioned cars, right? But I love you guys, and I want you to know more than anything as a pastor, what my heart is for you guys is to know God more to know him deeper, to ache for him. Take those moments. Build into your life a consistency of discipline. 
those moments when you're praying, those moments you're fasting, those moments you're worshiping, those moments you're meditating on him, purposely build into your life style those things. And then as you're doing it, let your kids see it. Help your kids to develop a love for God beyond, yes, Jesus loves me. Help them to get it so rooted into their hearts that when they are adults, then they pass it on. And so on. And so on. We're at a spot in our world. We're at a spot in our, in our lives that the world is trying to take everything from us. We've become so numb. We've become so unaware of what's happening. And this church is trying so hard to get you to draw closer to God. And I hope that this message this morning is just another encouragement that you just want to go to that next level with him. And if you want to say in your heart, honestly, hey Beth, I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't get it. This whole God thing, I come to church, I'm faithful. I stand in the middle of worship. I don't really sing, but I'm here. And I don't ever get it. I don't get those feelings and that whole thing. You know what you need to do? Is spend some time with just you and God and let him know that. And let him begin to speak to your heart. Through fasting, through prayer, through worship. You know what? Your relationship with Jesus Christ is not going to develop in this place. It's not going to develop in an hour and a half on Sunday mornings. This is just the plus. This is just the family of God getting to come together and celebrate for an hour and a half every week together. That's what church is. The deepness, the trueness, the stuff that lasts in the middle of the storms of your life, when, when the rough stuff comes, that comes in your prayer closet. That comes between you and him. And I challenge you, if you don't have that yet, find it. Talk to one of us. Talk to someone that you see that just loves God and say, how did you get to the spot that you love God so much? Man, I love to talk about him. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Well, let's stand and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us at the cross. Lord, we truly are amazed by you and how much that you love us. And Lord, I thank you that you've given us these chances, these opportunities, these places in our lives that we can get to know you more. That you don't remain distant. That you don't remain far away. That you don't remain this God sitting on a throne that we don't get to know. But God, that you are so intimate with us. That you speak into our very being breath that Lord that you want to shine your whole